Today, this afternoon, I'm going to be doing a little workshop about neurotechnology, uh, whole brain emulation, and how I see it as next steps for building at least uh, basic systems uh, based on my experience. Happy to take conver conversations, questions anytime uh, throughout the little talk. Uh, my background, uh, my name is Mark. I develop brain computer interfaces. I'm wearing one right now. Uh, I also have been involved with the Foresight Institute and also Cerebrum DAO, where we're working on funding and also bring, bringing out new neurotechnology products and brain health uh, products. So I'm coming to the idea of whole brain emulation, um, mainly as a product developer and thinking about like what are the things we could really build that would be tangible things that people could actually use and integrate into their lives as a first step towards building towards some of the larger um, theories or thoughts in whole brain emulation. And like many things um, that we're doing today, we've been trying to do them maybe for hundreds or thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years. Like thinking back to the way that we have gods and deities that have been growing up over different generations. I feel like many times we're always trying to understand ourselves, uh, create new analogies for understanding ourselves or the emotions or the, the, the functions that we have as humans. And I, I feel like that's probably also going to be intertwined with whole brain emulation and what's the actual purpose? What do we actually want to achieve with something like this? And is it more about understanding ourselves or also giving ourselves new capabilities as humans? Like every day we have different technologies whether it's simple things like eyeglasses, which give like a really critical capability to people who are losing their eyesight. So they can really live more fulfilled lives until the time that their longevity expires, unless we find a solution for that. And there have been already roadmaps around whole brain emulation. Uh, Anders was proposing this, I think, in 2008. Uh, he has a very nice, easy to read, 160 page document about whole brain emulation, talking about the things that we'll need if we want to achieve WBE. And it really breaks down to, I think, relatively simple concepts, right? We want to understand the, the structure and function of the brain. And from that, the question is, okay, what comes next? Is it about um, having people live outside their bodies, replacing their bodies, replacing brains with different bodies, replacing parts of the brain with another part of a brain? You know, what's, uh, what's really the point? And so I think about it as understanding structure and function in a particular point in time for a human or for a population of people allows us to then understand how the brain is changing over the course of a lifetime. We have huge challenges in neurodegeneration, which we might be able to have solutions for, but Irrespective of you know, solving something like Alzheimer's, we, we go through changes every day with our brain. Every, every brain is unique. Every brain changes based on the influences that we experience in our environments. Um, and some of those environmental factors could induce what we call damage, trauma, could have very long lasting effects, or it could be a very slow training of our brain. Um, creating new emotions, new ways, new pathways, new functions within ourselves. So that's the, the high level place of where I start. And then one of the questions is, okay, why would you want to emulate your brain? You already have a brain. Understanding like really what's going to happen to ourselves is one part of it, like one real part of it, like the way we, we model our brains, or the way we model our bodies already. You know, if we want to improve our health, become more energetic, we might go on a diet, a longevity diet, we might start working out because we're, we, we have a model for how our physical body might be changing based on exercises that we do. It's a bit more difficult to do that for the brain because many brains I think are more individualistic and we don't really have ways to measure day to day your brain state. Uh, some other high level concepts are preserving your brain. Uh, when I was young, I had a certain artistic talent, which I haven't used in a long time. And all of a sudden, I realized 10, 20 years later, I couldn't draw the same way I could draw when I was young, which was kind of annoying. I mean, nowadays, you could use AI. I could train the model on my old drawings, and then I could use that to re, let's say, take that, take that talent back if I'm creating a new drawing. 
So there's, you know, there's different aspects of our personality that uh, we would like to probably preserve. Because as we age from, from young people to adults to older people, you know, all these things are going to change. And it always uh, feels sometimes sad when you feel like you've lost something. It's also great when you feel like you've gained something. But we always have this uh, problem with eventual degeneration. And if we don't have a way to solve it, we could at least maybe preserve ourselves, not just cryologically freezing ourselves, but actually having something that we could interact with. And also enhancement. And also if we go towards thoughts of maybe we're going to be living in metaverses in the future, um, physical separation between our physical selves and the, the online presence that we have is already something many people do. If you're on social media, if you're on TikTok, if you're on Twitter, that the personality is probably different than who you are in the real world. And what if your presence could be interacting with that virtual world uh, instead of you having to do it every day? So you could still have your identity. People can enjoy your identity, or maybe their emulations can enjoy your emulation. So there's like really wild ways where, where whole brain emulation could go into very different directions. Even some people are considering that if you emulate, if your brain can be emulated, you, your personality can have new jobs, you could have hundreds or thousands of, your, of yourselves, and we could create new virtual economies in the world. Uh, so my background, I work in brain computer interface design, and we, we always like have some preconceptions, like what is a brain computer interface? How do we stimulate the brain? I mean, that's the question, right? You know, what, what is uh, a BCI? Like, there are some BCIs that can be just wristbands, which are vibrating in a certain frequency, so it actually triggers you to hear better. Uh, there are then the BCIs that are really invasive, deep brain stimulation. Um, but fundamentally, there's some sort of stimulation. We measure something, and we want to characterize the output, I would say. And we as people have so many uh, inputs day by day, second by second, millisecond by millisecond. And I would say it's uh, also increasing if you subject yourself to the, the online world like I do. And sometimes I realize I'm on YouTube for six, eight hours per day because I'm always looking at it kind of in between. I feel like my brain has to pull in more information. I want to soak up more information. I don't take time to stop. And then sometimes I have a headache and I crash. Do you feel like you're missing out on something? You have to engage with the world? Yeah, so we're trying to break down, you know, what, what do we need to emulate parts of our cells, parts of our brain? I think it still comes down to brain activity, the structure, we could say structure of thoughts. But all of this in relationship to the environmental influences that are around us. And this is really the, the key thing, because if we, right now, we're always thinking about, um, capturing our brain activity, it's probably only happening in small, discrete times. And we don't have a really good way yet to capture brain activity continually throughout the day and really understand how all these influences are affecting us. So I think fundamentally we can get to a low level whole brain emulation starting with AI agents, large language models, and wearable sensors. And that's really the, the crux of what I'm going to dive into. The, when, when you think about characterizing a person, Right. right now, many of us probably have a smartwatch on. It's collecting data continuously. Probably it's collecting motion data and heart rate data, maybe also ECG, maybe also sweat, maybe it's looking at metabolites. And we got into the point where we can collect tons of data. What does your aura ring data tell you? So it's doing the interpretation for you and it's none you're following its uh, recommendations. Yeah. Like we had this point where we could just collect tons of data and now with some wearable, we can take action, you know, based on what it's telling us. More difficult to do with the brain. Um, I love wearing my, my Fitbit or before my Xiaomi band. And for the most part, I'm just looking at what happened during the night. I haven't really been able to contextualize and integrate it into my daily life. But the potential is there. And even with like simple sensors, actually we can start to understand a lot about the structure of life. I mean, if you take your motion data and you compare it to historical data from different studies done by the NIH and other organizations, there's already publications out there where you can 
just use motion intensity as a marker for biological age versus chronological, chronological age. In Johns Hopkins, they were doing some analysis where you could really start to predict mortality just based on motion sensor data. I saw that with my parents. They get older, they start to lose spatial relationships between themselves and their environment. And we didn't even realize like how little my father was uh, starting to move um, because we we're just like so concerned with like him as a person, we kind of lost the, 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 the fabric of time. And then eventually, you know, he was stopping, stopping to move and then dying. Um, imagine if we could have simple ways to, to measure the brain and understand over the lifetime, like really what's happening to us. If we can understand, I think, motion, cardiac, eventually also metabolites and also the brain, it, it allows us to have a lot of the data necessary to create emulations of ourselves. And even just now, Google was releasing this uh, like two days ago, I believe. I think I heard it from Ori in the, uh, in the coffee shop. So they were releasing a personal health large language model where it's essentially, essentially an LLM, you know, trained together with wearable sensor data, coaching data, domain knowledge. And this is one way where people will, well, if they're not building it now, they're going to start building personalized uh, agents to help people understand actions to take based on their, on their health data just from their wearable sensors. So even just using like two or three metrics, we can already build agents that are going to be understanding you as a person you can talk to um, and then get recommendations or just have continuous feedback on how you're living your life. So we're, we're getting to the stage where we'll be able to build for ourselves agents which are, is, is understanding us. There was also a pretty amazing paper coming out one day ago on Twitter. So they essentially hooked up a brain-computer interface to a mouse. They were capturing the mouse's uh, neural activity and then fusing it to, the, to the, the biomechanical model of the mouse. Right? And then automatically they can start to, well, probably not automatically, it probably took a lot of time. But it's um, one of the most recent publications I saw where they're trying to fuse all the, the neural data they could possibly take from a very invasive implant and then use that as a model for understanding how that entity, that, that, that mammal, is going to be existing in, in the digital world. So you can already imagine um, this, like the very small levels of emulation, can already start or are being modeled at, at very low levels of mammals. So it starts to get closer to this concept of capturing structure and function. I was also working in the Foresight Institute on neurotechnology trees, so we're looking through different brain-computer interfaces, um, trying to map out you know, pathways for neurotechnology going forward into the future, and we investigated, of course, all the different imaging methods. You have magnetic, ima uh, magnetic, I mean, uh, ugh, magnetic imaging, functional imaging, um, put electrodes onto your brain tissue. You can get very high resolution data. Um, FNIR is deep brain stimulation, focused ultrasound. You might have heard from Sumner Norman earlier this week about all the potential for using minimally invasive devices to really measure what's happening in the brain. Um, and I focus on just uh, EEG. So I'll give a quick intro to some of the different techniques that we can use to then translate directly into the agent model. Um, but as we go forward, we're going to get more and more high resolution data. So I think all the building blocks that we could start from now will just improve and get more in depth uh, over the next couple of years. So we've been doing, a, we've been trying to really understand brain imaging for a long time. You know, it's going back hundreds of years, even EEG itself, I think is like 50 years old. We've had this ability to measure parts of the brain for a very long time. The difficulty has really been getting it down to a scale, which is really going to move with us throughout the day like a smartwatch does. So for a quick intro, um, EEG, basically nothing more than measuring the small electrical signals coming out of your brain. And deep down your brain tissue, you have your neurons. Neurons are firing, getting excited, and as different regions of the brain are firing at a similar time, they're creating enough 
electrical voltage potential where we can measure small voltage signals on the surface of the brain. Traditionally, this was done with gold cup electrodes where you would have a little conductive medium between the electrode and the scalp, and it allowed us to see relatively interesting things. So for example, when people are falling asleep, we could see that we're able to see differentiations in brain activity, different waves, the electrical waveforms could be broken down into different neuromarkers or classifiers. And this allowed us to start to map out the function of the brain while you're sleeping. There has been a lot of advances in neurotechnology over the past couple of years, um, primarily around trying to create better electrodes that will work during the day. So for example, having dry electrode technologies that can sit on the head or go inside the ear could combine with virtual reality. Been a lot of companies working on cool applications for this. And it's led to the rise of different brain computer interfaces that we could theoretically wear during the day, and some people do. Some of them are FDA approved, but many of them are relatively large and don't really integrate so well uh, into daily lifestyle. At the same time, uh, hearables, earbuds have been evolving uh, since the time that Apple was bringing out the iPod and everyone wanted to have cool little white earbuds in their, in their ears every day. Um, these have now been expanding into being not only things that deliver sound, but things that you, it's really an interface into your digital world now, right? You can talk to Siri, you can talk to your language model directly through your earbuds. We add motion sensors, some of them have heart rate sensors. Eventually, um, and that's what I work on, is adding EEG sensors into these earbuds. The purpose being that we can then track brain activity continually throughout the day or during the night. And it brings up the concept of the smartwatch for the brain. So if I have a smartwatch and I'm walking around with my smartwatch, I can get an idea of what's happening with my body in motion. And now we're going to extend it to the brain. So we released this product um, last year. It was a version two of our device. And essentially, it allows us to stream brain activity to the internet. So we want to have continuous data collection. The reason we want to stream our brain data to the internet is that we can then deploy classifiers, uh, AI machine learning pipelines, and then bring back the, the context, the understanding of what's happening to your brain through an API. And this then allows different people to build applications. And this is a really cool thing because different companies are going to understand different use cases, right? One company might be doing something like a music recommendation engine. One company might be helping people uh, regain speech from traumatic brain injuries. So we tried to be the glue, which is helping all these different companies build applications in gaming or audio or safety or productivity. So we have an online platform. We can stream brain data directly to the internet. And this allows us to also create daytime reports. So if you're doing a certain session, meditation, listening to music, whatever, uh, it's going to allow people to understand what is happening in the brain. And then in our roadmap, we're going towards smaller, more integrated systems where we really want to have the earbud be the, the interface that people are using every day to collect brain activity. And this is kind of modeled also in what NVIDIA has been talking about. So with very large language models, NVIDIA is pushing for a future where we're bringing in all information, right? Brain waves, amino acids, multimodal speech. They want to bring everything into their training model to start creating these huge foundational models. And I think this is where a lot of whole brain emulation is really going to start to make sense because if you can bring in all this data into one foundational model, that can then be back, deployed back to individuals to personalize it for their own brains. Um, and people are always asking first, okay, does it really make sense to go from a lab scale brain interface to something that you wear during the day? So we did a lot of validation to work out how a, a mobile EEG device can actually collect data, which has the same or similar resolution to clinical grade systems. So this is the current uh, system we're using. I'm also wearing it. Uh, this is our version three device, which will also include audio. And long term, as a designer, what I'm thinking about is how do we get to the point where the 
the application for BCI is basically just something that you open up on your phone where you can then say, hey, I want my cognitive workload to be shared with Spotify so it can create an optimal recommendation engine for me. Or it can create the optimal playlist so that I can focus best. Or I want to send my stress data to my Fitbit so it tells me that I need to sleep eight hours longer today so that I can recover because I worked so hard. Now that's, there's other companies that are also working in mobile BCI that I think are going to bring a lot of value. I think like multiple companies are going to provide the solution. Neurable has their focus buds, focus over ear um, devices. So these are basically delivering audio, very high quality audio, and also tracking focus during the day. Also in San Francisco, you have Neurosity. Uh, they were developing a crown, so this is going on, on the head. It delivers also raw EEG. You can use it as well with a focus application, so it's helping you to shift into focus based on the, the audio that's being played. I think it also integrates with Spotify, and it's really creating the foundation for neuroadaptive experiences. And just the ability to extract that information day by day, I think is, is really what is leading them to create large data sets, which can then be used in the foundational model training. So from using their application to enhance focus, it gives value to the user, but it's also collecting all that data so it can be used to train thousands of data sets and build out that initial large language model for EEG and brain data. And currently, you can go online, check out Crown GPT. And they essentially started with a Neuro GPT, which was a model that was used um, from EEG data from other sources. And now we're looking, at, we're looking at retraining it together with the Crown data. And this is really where whole brain emulation gets interesting, because when we have multiple BCI devices from multiple manufacturers going into and being trained into big foundational models, that's creating the baseline, understanding how your brain and other brains are affected by music, media, and all the other things going on in the world. The missing piece is understanding and doing it effectively. So if I have my brain data, let's say I'm streaming my brain data to you right now. So this is uh, the interface for our system. And if you start a recording, it's basically going to start streaming data directly to our server in Frankfurt, and then coming back uh, to, the, to, the, to my computer screen. So, yes, quick question. What am I thinking? That is one of the important and good questions that people are always asking. So yeah, we, we have privacy is built in from the beginning. Uh, so for example, right now I actually don't have a, I don't really have a profile on the system, so we do a separation between the, the user data and the, the brain data. There are um, applications going towards neuro fingerprinting, and this is also kind of an open debate. Is brain data personal data? Is it identifiable data? Um, and to what level you know, does it respect GDPR? So this is, of course, one of the big things with these large language models is how are we recording data, transferring it, are we de-anonymizing it? Should we be using generative methods to remove um, identifiable data from the EG before saving it in these large databases? That's a big open question and we don't have an answer yet, but it, it's very important. I should also say the data is encrypted on the device, it's encrypted as it flows to the computer, and it's encrypted as it flows to, to the cloud. So hopefully no one is able to tap into the Bluetooth signal on my device and read my brain waves. If anybody can, that would be awesome, please tell me about it. And what we're doing with partner organizations is that, you know, another company would have a user profile for you as a person, right? their API would then have to call and get the, the output of the brain data to then build it into their application. So we're creating like this natural separation between like the raw EEG data 
and, and the use case. So for the most part, I would say we're doing a good job of thinking about these protections and, and implementing them. But this is a big concern for, for everyone, you know, the AI safety and understanding how you can protect your identity. So, Ori, can you tell me what I'm thinking? Like, what value does this data have if it's just streaming here? Like, you, you can assume it belongs to me, right? You, like, can you, can you emulate my brain from this? Like, this without context, without knowing that I'm standing here and it's not geolocated, without knowing, you know, anything about what was going on in my brain, to, to a large extent, that's kind of useless. Like, the most important thing as we're building out these systems is the ability to tag data under, so for example, if, this was a music player, and it knew I was playing a particular piece of music from Spotify. That would be perfect, because then you automatically would understand the context of how these brainwaves are being recorded. And that's gonna be the key going forward, is building out the systems where it's really, like it knows what is happening. Because without that, okay, you're gonna understand the basic um, character of the signal, but I want to understand really we you know what is the function. And so alongside, um, I showed you the, the first crown that Neurosity is developing. They're also developing now new systems which are also smaller and more mobile. So you can imagine, you know, it's not just Eden trying to create highly mobile BCIs. Neurosity and other companies are doing this as well. And so I think there's going to be a lot of good different ways for people to use BCIs. Just like everyone else, you know, many people have different smartphones. They have different earbuds. They have different headsets. BCIs should be, anyone who have, wants a BCI should be able to choose their own flavor, right? Some people like to wear earbuds all day, some people don't. And I think the great thing is we're going to have a lot of different data sets flowing into these foundational models. And that is going to give the, the crux of being able to then build WBE at a low level. Um, even when like ChatGPT was first coming out, uh, there were people already using the crown and doing very basic things like you know, using one classifier for brain activity, sending it to a prompt generator in ChatGPT, so you could already start to create these basic non-intuitive or, let's say, subconscious interactive mechanisms between the brain and AI. And this is so cool, because when we have tagged data, when we have metadata for each recording, and really like, you know, second by second, that's gonna give us the context for having the training between the, the structure and function of what's happening in, in people's brains longitudinally. Even if it's a very single, you know, simple single channel EEG signal, I think it's gonna give us a ton of value as a society. Because when we have an understanding of how the brain is changing, when we have an understanding of how different interventions are affecting brain activity, like that's the basics of what you need. You know, if I know that I need to run or I need to walk 10,000 steps per day, to not die at age 60 instead of 70, that gives me the context of how to change my life. That's a very basic intervention. Imagine what we'll be able to do when we can understand changes in basic cognition related to the books you're reading, the movies you're watching, the music you're listening to, the drinks you're having. I think it's gonna open up really an amazing way to do a very simple emulation of the brain. Sleep is a really important thing. Uh, everyone, for the most part, sleeps, very few people don't, I, th I thought it's not possible not to sleep as, as, a, as a human. And that's one reason why EEG was first really pioneered and used clinically to understand sleep. So these, for example, are my brain waves. This is from an overnight study that was done with a 19 channel, high resolution system. And the question is like, what's happening here? You know, because you understand the context of sleep and because sleep has been characterized, a sleep technician will look at this uh, peak happening around the, this frequency range, 12 to, well, it was like 11 to 15 hertz. And apparently when I was talking to the psychologist who was uh, checking out my data, she said, hey, you know, you're actually at a, you kind of have a, a high um, possibility of getting depression. You might want to consider going into therapy and thinking about starting to take anti antidepressants. The reason is that she was seeing uh, a change in the, in the spindle density, which has been shown to be related to increasing biomarkers for depression. 
And now a lot of this stuff, it's still, you know, these are things that can be understood clinically, but it's not something which is integrated into a large language model. But the really cool thing is that with our system, we are able to do comparisons between in-ear EEG and full scalp EEG. We saw that we could capture a lot of the same signals that we can get with full scalp. But if we're translating it to being a, a mobile system, it means all of a sudden we're able to capture the stuff throughout the day, throughout the night, over multiple nights, not just over, over a couple of nights when you go into a clinic. And that's another piece of information which you don't get just from a, from a wearable device like a, like a Fitbit. The Fitbit will also do sleep characterization as your aura ring will do. You know, you're gonna look at changes in motion activity together with changes in heart rate, um, but it's still not directly capturing what's happening inside the brain. So for example, when you have things like narcolepsy, REM state, and also when you want to really characterize these individual sleep spindles or K-complexes, the little neuromarkers, those aren't things that you're going to be able to do just with a smartwatch. And the cool thing is that for different changes in, in the brain, um, sleep spindles, for example, there are small bursts of alpha activity. The density of those have, has been related to mild cognitive impairment, which is then related to Alzheimer's disease. And there's really just so many different things that we have seen clinically, but haven't been able to really scale because it's very difficult to scale EEG data collection, just like it's even obviously very difficult to scale higher resolution imaging studies like fMRI or MEG or FNIRS. So for example, this was my recording from about two nights ago. At the top, you have your raw EEG. That's a time-based signal, very difficult to <laughs> capture anything from. But then in between, I started listening to music. Like first I was walking, so the signal was disturbed a bit. And then I was settling down. When I started to pass out, fall asleep, because I was still jet lagged um, after flying over from Switzerland, you're starting to see the increase in alpha activity and relaxation, right? Just doing, if you just see that and you don't know that I was listening to, I think it was like 432 Hertz music on YouTube, it's, it doesn't give you much information, but when you have that information, it starts to give you the ability to build out a model for my brain. And when, when you've given uh, VCI devices to hackathons, we, we gave out uh, one of our devices to a group in Paris at the Neurotech X hackathon. Uh, the team did a really cool job of taking the data, breaking it down into the frequency bands, and then connecting different frequency bands to prompt inputs to stable diffusion. So they were using that as a way to do art generation, you know, just from brainwave data. And it's really cool because it, there's so many different things you can use the BCIs for. Um, outside of doing clinical research, we can really use them as a way to bring new ways of creativity to, to the world. And we're also looking at doing different pilot studies. So we were at the Brain Jam in Copenhagen uh, like a month ago. And during the brain jam, everyone is like super focused, you know, super cognitively loaded. And then we did a small pilot study where we're playing music, also using red light to enhance relaxation of people. Um, and this is, we, we did a first pilot study collecting the brain data together with heart rate, and we're going to expand this into, into the future. And the cool thing is that, again, if you just had the brain data, it wouldn't mean anything. If you know that red light is hitting the person, and we could integrate this also with uh, different wearable sensors, it allows us to build, start building out that foundational model. Also, just with, um, we've done studies with uh, partner companies, uh, Sema Therapeutics, they do digital therapeutics. They look for biomarkers and EEG data. And they, we, they did a study with psilocybin to see the before and after effect of alpha activity using, uh, using the single channel and 19 channel devices, and they saw that it was possible to really start to characterize the, the treatment journey of psychedelics. So again, the, the interesting thing is not just that we see changes in brain activity, but if we're also understanding how chemicals, different chemicals are affecting the brain, and we can scale that, this opens up like so many opportunities for building out a, an emulation model which is really truly multimodal. And if we can do this with uh, chemical sensors, and this is where we, we're lacking the technology, but as we bring out uh, fluid biomarkers and chemical sensors, 
and bring those into large language models, it's going to get super crazy super quickly. Um, other biomarkers that we're working on that we've done, like basically proven in the, in the lab is cognitive workload. So cognitive load is super, I would say super important because it's really a measure for how intense your, your brain is working on different activities. In this case, um, we did a characterization where people are doing easy math problems and then hard math problems. You can basically see a change in the, the frequency relationships from the single channel EEG. And then we can bring that down into a cognitive load score. And you can imagine this is, this is quite analogous to having like a, a score for your sleep. You know, if you, when I open my Fitbit in the morning, it says, oh, your sleep score was whatever, 60 or 75 or 85. It gives me a basic marker for how my sleep was during that night. If I have a relationship between my sleep and how my brain was working, then I can start to understand recovery. I can really under, start to understand how my brain is personally working in relationship to the lifestyle that I've been living. And that then starts to form this foundational picture for wearables and AI agents. So I'm gonna let's go to go into the idea that structure and function are really a relationship between state determination and neural insights. So I'm probably just hitting on this point too much at this point, but through a sensor fusion, we form the data layer to start enabling brain emulation at the very low level. What we do with that is a big question. Um, we're at the point where we can understand like what you're watching, Already we, we talked about, you know, is Facebook or Twitter a brain computer interface, right? It's stimulating your brain in a particular way. It's stimulating your brain in a way which has been designed, most probably, by UX researchers and product owners and product developers. So we already know that we can manipulate people, we can manipulate people's thoughts through information, through the way that you're being trained to respond to, to a different piece of news media, for example. So there's a lot of uh, what, you call, what you could solve, call the dark side of brain emulation, um, which, as you say, um, I think should be protected against. A lot of that goes back to personal protection of your neural rights, of your neural data. And that's also why, when I think about brain emulation, you shouldn't just think about things being built on giant cloud servers. Think about things that are going to be running locally on your devices, right? So if my brain is being collected here on, a, on my local device and my agent model is running locally on my phone, it doesn't have to necessarily talk to another server. I think these are some of the foundations that are really gonna make sense to build at the early stages. The other big thing is emotional characterization. I mean, we talk about things like mental workload, um, effort, but I think many times when we think about us as people, we think about how we emotionally respond to different environments, right? This is sometimes something that separates us, where it feels like people don't feel our emotions, don't feel the same way that we feel. We've done a good job, or we've, we've done an initial job of trying to characterize emotion in different ways. Uh, for example, looking visually if someone is happy or sad, and then building models which are trying to predict if you're happy or sad, just visually, but it also, I don't say, is like 100% accurate. Um, but we've done a lot of work over the past 10, 15 years in basic recommendation system design, right? So everything, Netflix, YouTube, Spotify, right? All this was built on basic trainings of recommendation systems. You hit a like on YouTube or Facebook, you watch a certain video, it has metadata, that can all go into your recommendation model. And then sometimes you watch some random video, all of a sudden they're recommending these videos about something you had no intention to really watch or care about, but it's trying to push you in the, in the direction where it thinks you want to go. So the real super interesting thing is how brain-computer interfaces are going to inform these recommendation engines because they, they, they're trying to model your your joy, they're trying to model what it thinks you want in media, what you want to experience in the future. So like philosophically, I think that's super cool because that's essentially what um, an emulation of your body, an emulation of your desires is doing. And it's something that we can capture but use it for ourselves. 
so the, this interpretation of, of data and value based on how we're experiencing the digital world, this is like a really big part of how we've been building brain emulation so far. We just didn't realize it. Now with large language models, um, these are very, I mean, they're traditionally about natural language processing. And although there's been like a lot of cool stuff happening with LLMs, crazy stuff with ChatGPT, I mean, what is it doing? At the end of the day, it's predicting a sequence of letters. It's predicting what letters should come next. It's predicting what words, sentences, phrases, paragraphs should be generated for you based on the prompts that you're creating. And if you think about what, what is that exactly? Well, it's just a sequence of elements. And your brain, of course, as I was showing, is also just a sequence of waves that we're measuring. And that's why large language models really make sense to use as a foundational way to build these models because they're also sequence generators. So there was first NeuroGPT where they're using time-based EEG signals, putting them into transformers, and then starting to build a GPT model. The cool thing is that model is out there. It's open source. You can access it, retrain it. Uh, with Neurosity, they were starting to collect their own data sets, retrain it with the, with the Crown GPT model, which is also out there. Very cool to check out. So the, the, the point of the, these um, foundational models is that they're taking in different types of, they're taking in EG, but from different devices, from different modalities. But they're putting them one, into one foundational model. The next point of that is to take that model and then optimize it for you personally, for your brain-computer interface, or for your thoughts. So for example, when we go to my thoughts, if we know that I was walking at one point because we took the motion data from my wrist or we, the motion data from my sensor, if we know that I was listening to 432 beats YouTube because you're talking to the YouTube API, it's combining with the API from the brain-computer interface, then boom, you understand context, you understand uh, neural activity. And that's all we need to start creating interpretation and also real agent models. So I think well, if at any point you think about um, whole brain emulation, you think about the technology that we have right now, and I say, hey, if a brain computer interface exists and it's possible to collect my brain data, then it's inevitable that emulation will happen. Like we are already trying to do that with recommendation engines. We're trying to emulate the way that my emotions are reacting to SpongeBob or Donald Trump and then create a, a call to action for me to click on a button and buy an ad, right? Now as a person, I want to emulate my brain because I want to have the, that control over what my emulation is going to be doing in the digital world. So this is going to be happening, I think, whether we like it or not. The question is whether we're active in controlling how it's being created or just using the, the product after, it's, after the fact. Um, and this goes into the, the nice evolution of language models and knowledge access in general. Like we started with hypertext documents, we went to search engine evolution, chatbots, and the way now that we now access information is through domain-specific knowledge management, right? If you ask a question to ChatGPT, it's going to be probably a generalized answer. But the really cool thing is building the fine-tuned large language models for you personally. So all your data goes into your large language model. It gets trained maybe locally on your device. And then it gets used by you personally. And I think, and if you choose to allow your emulation agent out into the world, then you can allow it to do that. So the, what we've done in some decentralized science projects is to start looking at how tech trees as knowledge graphs combine with APIs from new knowledge sources, and then we build out a, a knowledge retrieval system so we can customize uh, a language model. And fundamentally, the same thing is happening with EEG data or MRI data. When we have the access to that knowledge, for example, all the notes that you wrote on Twitter, 
all the videos that you put on YouTube, that goes into your foundational model, right? That's relatively actually easy to do nowadays. So you can really start to build out that model for how you react, how you talk, how you think. There are tools that we can use. The human AI, AI pin was one of them, but you can also build your own open system for what, like $40, $50 that's recording your voice uh, throughout the day. And all that information goes into that definition of you in the AI agent world. So this combination of your personal data, the way that you function with your brain, um, with your biology, with your motion, I think we're at the point where, I mean, we can build these systems. I know many people are starting to build these systems. I'm building out some of the prototypes for these systems. Like this is the, when, when I think about whole brain emulation, this is a thing that makes sense to focus on because this is a thing that you can really work on, build and use today and tomorrow. And it helps to inform what we need for emulation systems for the future. And if they actually make sense, if they're bringing any value to society. Now, AI agents have been a big topic. You can go check out a lot of stuff on Abacus AI. They publish really great overviews for how agents can be built and used directly in, um, on their platform. You can also work through Langchain and Flowwise AI. You can build out AI agents and customize LLMs super easily. But it's where, the, where I think a lot of different people are going, maybe just from different directions. You know, maybe Abacus AI isn't thinking right now about including EG data in their system. But it's just a time-based data source, right? It's not something which is fundamentally difficult. It's just a connecting to a different database with a different labeling system and bring it into the transform model. So that's why um, right, right now I feel like we have gotten to the point of solving part of the, the brain-computer interface problem of creating low-level emulation. The next thing to really focus on is building out some agent frameworks, um, probably first in Langchain and probably first using the, the output classification of EEG data. And it's really exciting to think about how we could do this. I mean, first in hackathons or in small company projects. So I think if anyone is interested in also collaborating on agent design, I think it would really make sense to also create some of this as like open source knowledge, open source projects, because then it's also very accessible and transparent. I mean, we don't, you know, I think probably the worst thing would be your data is being scraped, pulled from all these different sources, create an emulation of you, which is going out into the world, which you didn't authorize. <laughs> And, and I mean, there's no reason why that, that couldn't be happening right now. I mean, we have generative AI. You can generate your own person. Someone else could generate it for you. It's really, I'm kind of surprised it hasn't gotten that crazy yet because when we have an agent core, I feel like all the pieces are there. I feel like all we need to do is uh, build it out into a first system, first prototypes, and then see how it, how it really works. So. Looking forward to focusing on this. Uh, very happy to collaborate with other people and see how we can build out some sort of cool AI system which is starting to emulate you uh, at a certain level. Because that starts to inform and open up the ethical questions. Oh, what really makes sense? What are the real features? What are the real requirements that we want to have for whole brain emulation going forward? From low level to let's say more medium level to maybe eventually organoid level. Those are the building blocks for whole brain emulation that I see at this point in time. I think wearables, LLM agents, and are going to lead to the foundational models, which lead to the personalization, which lead to the emulation. The roadmap seems kind of clear to me. I mean, we could build it out into something more, more concrete, but love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you think that kind of makes sense, if it's crazy, if it's uh, totally wild and a waste of your time. But I'm very happy, you know, I started some of these graphics a few years ago where we, I was at, hey, we're at sensors and interpretation. But actually we're getting to action and autonomy a bit faster than I thought we would. And it's becoming more flexible and more easy to do. So thank you so much for your time. It's really been a pleasure.